The coming king is at the door. And that we should wait for him and murmur not. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you very much for those lovely numbers, Sister Charles. I don't, you know, uh, all of us are shy a bit, you know, sometimes, you know, the pastor was talking about this, you know, nervousness, yes. nervousness. But it happened to everybody, you know, but the more you do, is the less nervous you become. That's right, it's the Kalia. The Kalia. I have, I'm so happy to see her here today. Um, I knew Sister Nakalia for a very, very long time. Uh, all these years that from Brooklyn Fate to New Dimension. And she is, uh, used to be a really upstanding member of our church. I tell you, Sister Kayla can handle almost any office Amen. that you put her to. Amen. And I know God has been blessing her Amen. over the years. Nice to see you and nice to see your daughter, but she told me she had to leave. Sorry about that. I want to say thanks all to Sister Jillian for that lovely story yes. for children this morning, teaching our children about honesty. Yes. And our Hell Corners, Brother Aki, teaching us ways we should nourish our bodies. Thank you so much, thank you. And I also want to say thanks Brother Henry for that lovely song. Amen. The wonder of it all, Amen. just to think that God loves me. Amen. It's a beautiful thing, just to think Amen. that God loves us Amen. and has done so much for us, has put himself out there for us despite all of the problems and the trouble that we gave him, he still go out there and put himself out there for us. Let us pray, let us pray. Oh Lord our God, loving Father, giver of all good gifts, oh Lord we thank you for inviting us into your presence today. Lord, we have come empty. We pray that we will be fed at your table today. Keep us safe under your arms and feed us according to our needs. In Jesus' name, amen. The message, sanctification, what is it? Today we are going to focus our attention on another aspect of Christ or righteousness and justification by faith. Thank you, Alan. Justification by faith. This aspect is called sanctification. Looking at sanctification and justification, some people will tell you that justification is what Jesus does for us, but sanctification is what we do for him. As a result of our justification. But is sanctification what we do for him or what he does in us? Is it what we do or what he accomplishes in, in us? According to our scripture reading, which was read very well by our brother Aki, let us look at our scripture reading in 1 Corinthians 1, verse 29 to 31. It begins, that no flesh should glory in his presence. 
But of him are you in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Friends, if Paul thought that Christ is made unto us sanctification, then sanctification would have to be something that Christ performs on our behalf. Justification is the work of a moment. A heart responds to what Christ has already accomplished for us, for our salvation. Sanctification, on the other hand, is that holy, daily experience with God that continues throughout the lifetime of the believer who continues to walk with God by faith. The gospel not only freely gives us the righteousness of Christ in order to deliver us from the condemnation of the law, but also as a personal experience that will change us to become more like him so that one day we will perfectly reflect Jesus to this world. Therefore, justification by faith cannot be the entire gospel. For that is only part of the good news. God did not send Jesus, his beloved son, to this world merely to legally clear us from sin and to declare our righteousness. He sent him to free us from sin and to restore his image in us. This work of restoration includes sanctification, which is also a part of the good news, Brother Aki. Good news of the gospel. Ephesians 4, verse 11 to 15, is clear that God's purpose for his church, the members of Beacon of Light, is to fully reflect the character of Jesus Christ in this world. This is the plan of salvation in a nutshell. Verse 11 says, And he gave some apostles, and some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors, and some teachers, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Until we all come into that unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the statue of the fullness of Christ. That we, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men, and the cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive, but speaking the truth in love, may grow up into him in all things which is head, even Christ. This is the only way that God chooses to demonstrate to a lost world his son's power to destroy sin and the perpetuator of it, the devil. Only by putting together justification by faith 
which is the receiving of Christ or righteousness and sanctifi sanctification by faith, the experience of his righteousness. Do we have a more complete and accurate, accurate picture of what righteousness by faith is re really is? Paul also wrote in Philippians 3 verse 9 to 11, and he said, be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is true, the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Paul is talking about the conclusion of his experience here on earth. He says, that at a future date, a future time, when Jesus comes, or when his name is called, or when he's been examined, that he wanted to be found in him, not having his own righteousness, but having the righteousness of Christ. Amen. You know, one author talking about justification and sanctification says, that the righteousness by which we are justified is imputed righteousness. Yes. The righteousness by which we are sanctified is imparted righteousness. Yes. The first is our title to heaven. The second is our fitness for heaven. Yes. Messages to young people, volume 1, page 35. What does imparted means? The dictionary says it is to bestow a share of something to give from someone's store of abundance. In other words, imparted righteousness means something comes from one person to another. Something he gives from his own abundance. Something that I lack. And there are similarities, yes? And these similarities in imputed and imparted righteousness. But both comes to us from God. They are not something we perform for him, but rather something that he has which he imparts to us. Yes. Sanctification is not given to us all at once, but it does come from him to us. Yes. According to Philippians 1 verse 6, the one who started this good work in you will perform it to completion, which means he who ignites, he ignites the work of justification in you, he carries on the work of justification and he will complete the work of justification to glorification right. in your life. Amen. Christ is the only depositor of justifying righteousness Amen. and sanctifying grace. Amen. This grace that brings about sanctification is found in him, yes. not in your pastor, no. not in Sister Grace, oh, even yes. though we love her so much, Amen. or any other person. This grace is found only in Jesus. Amen. You go to him to find it, and by his grace, he gives it to you. In sanctification, something proceeds from him to us. Right. And I am not just talking about asking God for help, you see. Mercy. Or a little push. Mercy. Or a shove of some kind. That's not the kind of help we are talking about. Here it is more than a push. Or a shove up the rugged hill. It is more than assistance. 
Literally, something must leave from him to me. And it is more than power. Are you hearing me? Paul says, he has something I lack. And I must go to him to receive it. For I cannot produce it by myself. Christ and him alone can supply this need to my life. When we are seeking sanctification, it means we are seeking righteousness. And what is righteousness? If you were here, when I spoke on what is righteousness, you will remember that I told you that righteousness is love. That's right. But what is righteousness in relation to sanctification? One author says, obedience to the law is sanctification. Signs of the time, May 19, 1890. Sanctification is the doing of all the commandments of God. Signs of the Times, March 24, 1890. And this sanctification, the doing of the law, many of us might find troubling or confusing. And it is all because of misinterpretations. For instance, some argue that righteousness and sanctification are not obedience. They say it's not right doing, but rather right relationships. It is true that right relationships produce right doing, but the relationship is not the righteousness. And we must be careful not to see it that way. Some people look at the law and before they can realize it, they are examining themselves, looking to see if they are doing everything as the law demands according to the commandments. But is sanctification the avoidance of every thou shall not and the correct performance of every thou shalt. Mercy. And is that sanctification? Mm. We established earlier that sanctification is obedience to the law. But is sanctification the perfect living? Mm. The standard for proper entertainment or health reform or dress reform. You know, my friends, Many people use these to look at themselves and judge their actions and performances to see if they are being sanctified. And when the scrutinizing of self shows them their failures, they begin to think they are not going to make it into the kingdom. And before long, give up their efforts in discouragement. We said that sanctification is obedience to the law, God's Ten Commandment laws. But what are these commandments like? The best way to see the law is through the eyes of Jesus, who is the perfect representation of the law. Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love thy neighbor, thou, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor, as thyself. On these two commandments are all the laws and the prophets. Matthew 22 verse 36 to 40. To understand sanctification you must look at the law. 
through the eyes of Jesus. Amen. We Seventh-day Adventists see the law as written on tablets of stones with the love of Jesus left out of it. The Jews were doing the same thing. They left Jesus out of the law to the point where they were violating the law. They had a 300 addition to the Sabbath law on bearing load on, the, on, on burden on the Sabbath day. They expanded the commandment to the point where they had figured out every thou shall not. To guarantee they were not violating the law. And to them, strict, strict obedience to the law means they were being sanctified. And can you believe it? That there are thousands of us, seven-day Adventists today, who are following the same path. We have used the spirit of prophecy as our Talmud. And like the Jews, find all of the thou shall nots. And we check ourselves against them as, as a means of avoiding doing wrong. But I want you to know today that you can have a million laws against doing wrong, but you will still do wrong. It does not matter how many laws they are. People still do wrong. And the reason being is that the law do not change character. Are you hearing me out there? Only Jesus. Jesus does that. You can find laws that will restrict your children, but they will have problems. They are not changed by laws any more than you are changed by laws. Paul wrote about what the law could not do in that it was weak to the flesh. Yeah. Romans 8 and verse 3. And even though we are justified, we still have problems, my friends. Oh, yes. But thanks be to God, yes. he takes care of our problems yes. with his own method. Yes. Something we are not able to do with ours. Right. You know, my friends, the fundamental interpretation of the law by Jesus is that the law is love. That's right. And this love cannot mean the pervasive, the pervasive kind of lust that people are calling love today. The love I'm talking about is the one Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 1 to 3, 13. Amen. Amen. And I know that most of you are familiar with that love passage. Yes, and since the law is love, it makes obedience to the law more different than most of us have imagined it to be. If you remember some time ago, we established that righteousness is holiness, likeness to God, and that God is love. 1 John 4 and verse 16, righteousness is conformity to the law of God. For all thy commandments are righteousness. Psalms 119 verse 172. And love is the fulfillment of the law. Romans 3 and verse 10. Righteousness is love and love is the light and the life of the Son of God. The righteousness of God is embodied in Christ and we receive righteousness by receiving him. Amen. Mount of blessing, page 18. God is love and the law is a transcript of the character of God. So the law is love. So obedience to the law is love. So righteousness is love. And 
sanctification, which is obedience to the law, is love. Friends, this is different than most of us have anticipated in sanctification. For we have left love out of the, the sanctified life entirely. And egocentrically, look at ourselves to see what our hands do and where our feet go and what our lips speak. We look at what we eat. And what our ears heard, and we ask ourselves, am I being sanctified? But no, 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 that is not sanctification. For the whole spirit of sanctification is eliminated. And we are left looking at ourselves. And while we are looking at self, we become more self-like. And... Less sanctified. Church, righteousness is love. And that love is expressed in action. Therefore, in sanctification, there are works and doing and activities. Those of you who are married knows exactly what I'm talking about. Your spouse can say they love you all they wish, all their life. But unless they perform the acts of love, you will have have a lot of difficulties accepting their claim of love for you. Love must be expressed in action. Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. John 14 and verse 15. The keeping of the commandments are prompted by our love for Jesus. And if we do not love him, we can forget about keeping his law of love. For this can only truly happen out of a heart of love. Jesus said, The commandments are supreme love for God and love your neighbor as yourself. Friends, it is the activity, the doing for good, the doing for God and for your neighbor that fits into the model that Jesus taught to his disciples. Let us see this in the context of sanctification, Matthew 25 and verse 34 to 40. Jesus told this thrilling story. I say chilling because it points to a future event that Jesus himself will preside over. It's a judgment scene that should not be taken lightly. Jesus says that the time will come When the sheep and the goat, those who have accepted Jesus as personal savior from sin, and the unbeliever who have not, who have rejected him, will be divided into two groups, one on the right side of Christ and the other on the left side. Then shall the king Jesus says, Unto them on the right hand, come you blessed of my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I, I was an hunger and you gave me meat. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in naked. And you clothed me. I was sick. And you visit me. I was in prison. And you came unto me. Then shall the righteous answered and said unto him, Lord, when saw we thee hungered and feed thee, or thirsty and gave thee drink? And when saw we stranger and took thee in, or naked and clothed thee? 
or sick or in prison and came unto thee. And the king shall answer and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Inasmuch as you have done this unto the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. Amen. Jesus, my friends, is drawing our attention to the works that are examined in the end. Right. Works that are important in this life. Right. And we make a difference. And we'll make it. And we'll make. <laughs> sorry. Come on, come on, come on. And we'll make a difference in the life to come. These works were prophesied by Isaiah right. and described by the life of Jesus. And the truth is that we are called, we are summoned to be like Christ in justification. We cannot make ourselves like Jesus, but he is able. He is able to make us like him. That's right. Isaiah said, is not this the fast that I have chosen to loose the bond of wickedness, to undo the heavy burden, and to let burden and to let the oppressed go free, and that he break every yoke? Is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry, and that thou bring the poor that are cast out to thine house? When thou seest the naked, that you cover him, and that you hide not yourself from thine own flesh. Isaiah 58, verse 6 to 7. This activity, this activity of responding to the needs of others shows our supreme love for God and love for our neighbors. Elder Carey. Yes. Listen to what Job had to say in that regard. Job says, because I delivered the poor that carried, uh, that because I delivered the poor that cared, because I delivered the poor that cared and the fatherless and him that had none to help him. And I cause the window's heart to sing for joy. He said, I was eye to the blind and feet to the lame. Job is claiming righteousness that his living reflected the righteousness of Christ. And that the activities in his life reflect the obedience to the law of God, the law of love. Job also spoke about the opposite side of living a righteous life and what the result would be like. He said, if I despise the cause of my servants, if I withhold from the poor their desires or cause the widow eyes to fail or eat in my food alone and on and on, Job is saying that he showed appropriate response to the needs of his neighbors, to the needs of his neighbors. And if I did anything less than what was right by them, then his arms should fall out from the shoulder blade and my arms be broken off from my bones. For this destruction from God was a terror to me, and I could not endure it. Job 31, verse 13 to 21. Job is saying, I was not a selfish person. And this activity is what Christianity is all about. What we are learning from Job, what we are learning from him is genuine Christianity. That which many of us are practicing is far removed from what Jesus taught his disciples. What we see today is a perversion 
Are you hearing me? It's a perversion of true religion. All attempts to be righteous of ourselves, forgetting others, is selfishness. And this is not the righteousness the law is talking about or the righteousness that Jesus discussed. The aiming for some high position of exaltation where we will be acclaimed righteous is not righteousness by faith in Jesus. Yet, the righteousness we usually want and for which we examine ourselves is that kind where we reach some pinnacle of success, where we, will, where we think we are righteous, where we will hear the well done. But that is not it. That is not righteousness. That is not the righteousness that Paul and Jesus and Job spoke about. This kind of activity uh, described by Job and Isaiah is not an occasional once a week thing on community service day. It is not suddenly getting the idea one day to go out and help the poor or giving away Thanksgiving baskets on Thanksgiving Day. No, sir. It is not going out on Sabbath evening to distribute tracts. No, sir. They are speaking of a lifestyle that goes on every day. A lifestyle that cares for the needs of people. An obedience to the law of love. An activity of God. An activity of good works from a sanctified life. It is ongoing lifestyle. A regular routine. It is not self-discipline. Are you hearing me? It is a heart drawn out to people in need. All because they are human flesh. That's right. and, and, and we cannot bear to see them in need. Christ wept not because Lazarus was dead. But because he identified himself with the human needs. With hearts that are broken or aching. He was one with humanity. And his heart goes out to them. The question we must ask ourselves here today is this. Does my heart respond to people less fortunate and in need? Or do I manage to live in isolation, encapsulated in shells of selfishness? For experience. Experience has shown me that we can become so blind and so callous and so cold to the needs of others that they can be around us and we don't even see them. True sanctification is nothing more than the love God, to love God with all your hearts. Signs of the Times, May 19, 1890. Yes, to love God supremely and our neighbor as ourselves is genuine sanctification. Right. Signs of the time, February 24, 1890. True sanctification comes through the working out of the principles of love. And God is love. And he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God. And God in him, Acts of the Apostles, page 560. You cannot separate God from his love, which brings us back to Christ or righteousness. This love, which is righteousness, can only be, be found in him. In, can only be found in him. In the heart, can only be found in him is the heart of the problem. For, I my, for, for in my heart, I must love. I must have love for you like Jesus has for you. And I do not naturally have that kind of love. 
For I am naturally selfish, my friends. And my selfishness wars against the love I need to have for you. And if and is preventing me from loving you the way Jesus loves you. Jesus said, a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you. Amen. John 13, 34 to 35. Jesus was talking to his disciples. And for them, this commandment was new, for they had not loved one another as Christ had loved them. This commandment to love one another had a new meaning in light of his self-sacrificing, self-sacrificing love. And that his whole work of grace was one continued service of love, of self-denying, self-defying, self-sacrificing efforts. Jesus says, by this love all men will know that you are my disciples. Because you have love one for the other. When men are bound together, together not by force or self-interest, but by love, they show the working of an influence that is far above every human influence. Where this oneness exists is the evidence that the image of God is being restored in humanity. That a new principle of life has been implanted. It shows power in the divine nature to withstand the supernatural agencies of evil. And that the grace of God subdued the selfish inherit in the human heart. Desire of Ages, page 677. 678 to 678. Friends, it amazes me how many people are bound together for self-interest and not love. We can join church out of fear of being lost. We can work for God out of selfish interests. We have school teachers working at sacrificial wages, thinking it's your ticket to heaven. We can hold high office in church out of self-interest and send our children through the Adventist school system out of self-interest. And when they turn out wrong, we take it on and feel condemned at their failure. But can you imagine the day when the world sees us bound together, not by force or self-interest, but by love. Amen. Amen. How wonderful to be married by love right. and not by self-interest. That's right. That's right. Jesus was talking to his disciples about a peculiar oneness in relationship among them in church. That could not be found any other place in the world. This unique oneness was experienced at Pentecost and will happen again in that new, in that well known promise event called the latter rain. How may I obtain this love? Jesus says, let us love one another. For love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God, and knoweth God. 1 John 4 and verse 7. In other words, this love, I must go to God to receive it. For love, for love is of God, I must receive it from Him. For I do not have it, and I cannot make it, and will never develop it. This love, and will never, sorry, and will never develop this love out of my selfish heart. That's right. That's right. This love, you will find it only in Jesus. Amen. If you see me misusing my neighbor, or my spouse, 
or my children or any other person, you can be absolutely sure or certain that God has been dethroned in my heart. Which means I keep not the first commandment, loving God with all my heart. When you see me loving my neighbor as myself, you will say he dwells in love, so the Lord must be in him. Amen. Friends, it is as simple as that. Sanctification is an unusual relationship, a dwelling together first with God and then with one another. Amen. Sanctification is accomplished through the right relationship with Jesus. However, it is the result of the relationship and not the relationship itself. A relationship with Christ is not righteousness. The relationship continues as long as life shall last. It's like the marriage relationship. We will never part as long as both shall live. Friends, the world is waiting to see a group of Christians who are bound together because they love and cherish each other. Right. It does not matter what the color of their skin is or where they come from as long as they are bound together by love. No pressure, no force, no self-interest. Just the love of God constraining them. Amen. Friends, there is nothing like it to be old. That's right. And that's why Jesus says by this love, the world will know that you are my disciples because of your love, the love you show to one another. Amen. Sanctification, dear friends, is the marvelous love of God Manifested for me until I see it in all its glory. Amen. What is, what is sanctification? It is simply God coming down and tying our hearts together in love for him. Until we say, how can I help but loving him when he loves me so much? Amen. And when... When the love of God dwells in me, I will love, I will have love for my neighbor, for I cannot have one without the other. That's right. Yes, we are sanctified by his love and grace. May our lives with him bring us that announcement. Well done, the good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of thy Lord. To this end, God bless you.